and we're going to consider again the uh, Christian and complete armor by Gurnall. Now we had uh, we've been looking at the necessity for holiness and what Gurnall has to say about the necessity for holiness. And he dealt with the necessity of holiness in worship, and he dealt extensively with that. And then he moved on to deal with the Christian's need for a Christian to be holy in their employment, in the need for a clear Christian witness. And there were five points that he touched on there. And then last time he came to a third area, the need for holiness in our relationships, particularly within the family, although everything he says about the family spills over into other relationships as well. Now he has four things to say about this. He dealt with, we dealt with two last week, choosing wisely and directing carefully. That means there are two left and I want to deal with them pretty quickly and then come on to another a major section as quickly as I can. So dealing, first of all, then with the, the final two points about holiness in our family relationships, particularly. And the first point that he makes here, or, or the third point, if we're going to follow uh, the order from last week, is that we are to be careful to free ourselves from snares. Now, you might be saying, what in the world does Garner mean by that? Well, he explains it very quickly, really. He says some families, he says, are like renegades in that they do nothing but lead each other into temptation. And you can, you can imagine exactly what he means by that. They draw out one another's corruptions, he says, from year to year. And, you know, Satan is always ready to take advantage of, of family passions that can cause trouble and mischief, provoking even the Lord's people to cause one another to stumble and to defile each other. Now, he gives two examples. The first one is Abraham, and Abraham's fear, which he says set a sail for Sarah. Uh, you remember, he was afraid that if they discovered she was his wife, uh, that there would be trouble for them. So he, he persuaded her to, to misrepresent the relationship, and his fear laid a snare for her, who was easily persuaded to lie on behalf of the husband she loved so dearly, Genesis 12 and verse 13. The second example he gives is Rebecca and Jacob. Now, <clears throat> you'll know that, um, or you may remember that um, I, I do tend to make perhaps more of an allowance for Rebecca in that situation than some commentators do. Um, uh, there are those who blacken her entirely in that situation, and I do think that is a little unfair. Uh, I, I think she was a more spiritual woman than perhaps we give her credit for. But putting that to one side, a girl gives us as the example, and he says, well, uh, you know, she, her um, uh, attempts to deceive uh, Jacob and so on, and to, to gain the uh, to, to deceive um, Isaac, rather, um, uh, led Jacob, too, into that role and uh, the deception of his father. Garner puts it like this, and it's, it's typical of him. The skillful coercion of his mother made the bulky sin go down into the uttermost being of Jacob's life, though he strained hard against it at first. And that's really a very helpful explanation. Is it, there's something you, you can't swallow it, but you sort of manage to swallow it anyway, even though you would struggle at first. Be careful, he says, not to cause your family to sin. And he gives a, a little illustration. It would be a heartbreaking thing to watch your child suffer and bleed from a wound you had given him. But even an affliction like that might be better than an infection of sin and guilt that you caused. And then he turns to the other side of the coin and he says, let me remind you also that you have to be just as careful to present, protect yourself from receiving infection from your family as well as giving it to them. Don't lead others astray, but don't allow yourself to be led astray either. Obey God before you obey anybody else. And he mentions there particularly the husband 
wife relationship, but it applies across the board. Again, here's another little illustration. In business, we first pay the biggest debts which are already due. Well, in the same way, he said, you are more deeply indebted to God than to anybody else. Travel as far as you can with your relatives in God's company, but no further because you don't want to leave holiness and righteousness behind. No one, family or otherwise, can ever repay you in the loss of these treasures. So that's the third point he makes. Um, free yourself from snares and don't, don't set snares either. The fourth point he makes, and I'm going to deal with this very quickly, is take instruction from godly relatives. Holiness in the family will be helped if you take instruction from those who are more mature uh, than yourself in spiritual things. The good from their holiness is like precious ointment, which betrays itself wherever it lingers. And he gives the example of Elisha asking the widow to bring all the vessels that she could because the oil would overflow. In the same way, we are to take from what is overflowing in the lives of others, the holy oil of grace. It's sad, he says, to see what an evil heart does with the gifts and graces that are found within the family. It envies and maligns the Lord's people. And instead of gaining good, the person himself becomes worse. And he gives a, a very obvious example. He speaks of Joseph. Joseph told his prophetic dreams to his brothers, but their envy, which had been smoldering in their hearts anyway, caught fire. And soon it was a burning inferno. That was all the use they made of Joseph's godliness and his godly influence in their home. It could have been such a blessing to them. And no doubt years later, they looked back on that and reproached themselves. But better not to do it than to have to reproach yourself for it later. Well, he has a number of other things to say on that, but I'm, I'm not going to go into them just now. Because I want to move on and... What's our time doing? I want to move on and look at um, another area uh, that he touches on and we'll, we'll start it. We probably won't get terribly far into it. But he speaks about the power of holiness then in the neighborhood. He's been dealing with the family particularly, but now he's going to deal with the neighborhood. God hasn't commissioned your power of holiness to be confined behind both the doors. No, he says, it's meant to walk out into the street and visit your neighbors. It's not just typical way that he has of putting it. Your behavior and conversation with those about you should be holy and righteous. In scripture, righteousness and living righteously often implies the whole responsibility of the Christian to those around him. These terms are distinguished from piety, which God has made for, for ourselves, and sobriety, which rather respects ourselves as well first. But then he says we see them all together in Titus 2.11, where the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us to live soberly, yes, righteously and godly in this present world. So we're to have personal piety, but that is also to spill out in a godly life that others will see. We're not to be content with just the one or the other. And again, Gurnall has one of his little illustrations. If one of these graces is stabbed, he says, that's the, the, the where are they now? Um, sober, righteous, godly. If one of them is stabbed, they all die. And the life of holiness trickles out through the open wound. He's so good with these illustrations. It is true there is a moral righteousness which leaves us short of true holiness, but there's no true holiness which leaves us short of moral righteousness. And then he goes to, to, to give us an example of this. The utter failure to have holiness of life. One minute the tongue is praying to God and the next minute the same tongue is lying to man. Eyes read through the sacred scriptures only moments before they're away on some sinful errand. Sometimes the hands which were devoutly stretched to heaven are the same ones that rob his neighbor's pockets. 
How can your legs carry you to worship God on the Sabbath and then take you into the business world on Monday to cheat on your associates? Well, there it is. In a word, do you really think you can persuade heaven to waive your unrighteous acts towards man just because you exercise outward semblance of seal to God? Will your vocal artificial love for the Lord excuse the malice in your heart against your neighbor? Does devotion of God displace your obligation to man? God forbid that you should deceive yourself in this way. Peter's counsel to Simon Magus is my advice to you, Acts 8, 22. Repent of this wickedness and pray God. Perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. So the power of holiness regarding our neighbor. And that will be preserved when the Christian takes heed of two things. And I'm going to deal with these two things and that will be the finish. And what are these two things? Well, first of all, he says, holiness must be uniform. In other words, it's not to be stopping and starting. Our holiness must be lived out every day and equally distributed among all the responsibilities that we have among our neighbors. Here's an illustration. Righteousness runs like blood in the veins through every one of the laws in the second table of the Ten Commandments. The Fifth Commandment calls for obedience to parents, natural, civil, and spiritual. The Sixth deals with preserving our neighbor's life. The Seventh stresses purity. The Eighth concerns property. The Ninth concerns a good, protects a good name. And the Tenth teaches the keeping of our desires within due bounds. Well, health in the natural body is preserved by keeping the passages of life open for the blood and other vital fluids to move freely from one part to another. If any obstruction blocks them from flowing, the whole body's going to be in danger. In the same way, spiritual life and holiness is preserved by the Christian's diligence to keep the heart free and ready to perform each of these responsibilities he owes his neighbor as he moves through the several parts in every commandment. We are to keep holiness uniform. You're going to have a godly influence in your neighborhood. You can't just pick and choose which parts of holy living you're going to obey. It has to be uniform. And secondly, it must be evangelical. What does he mean? Well, outward obedience to the law is our road where Jews, Christians, and, and all manner of heathens may be found walking along together, says Garner. How can we distinguish the Christian from those others when they also are obedient children and good citizens and kind neighbors? Well, here's the answer. The motive that lies behind it makes all the difference. It's very common for men to wrong Christ and yet treat their neighbors with respect. They choose right behavior. But what's the motive? It's obviously not love for Christ that's constrained them. And without that love, you can be an honest, moral person. But you're never a Christian. Suppose a man trusts his employees to pay a certain creditor a sum of money. The person does this, not out of respect to the command or, or love for his boss, but out of fear of being called a thief. As far as the creditor is concerned, he's done his job, but that is all. His attitude has wronged his employer. And men scorn Jesus like this every day. They are exact and righteous in their transactions with their neighbors and associates, but they're insulting to Jesus. Love carries out righteousness because it wants to please God's Son. Christ called evangelical love to our neighbor, a new commandment, John 13. And then in, verse, in chapter 14, we read, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's why we read tonight in John 14. If you love me, keep my commands. Love is to be the motive. So holiness must be uniform and holiness must have good motive. We must make sure of that. Just as God set his name before his 10 commandments, 
For the same reason, Christ set his name before the Christian's obedience to these Ten Commandments. That is, we're to keep them because they're Christ's word and Christ's law. And so that we may illustrate our love to him who has redeemed us from the curse and brought us out of a far worse kind of bondage than Egypt was for Israel. And we have actually finished that section. So I'm glad we managed to bring that to a conclusion. That completes our studies of Garnell.